what exactly are we talking about? Because our mind is so dazzled with folklore, and we cannot separate folklore from fact. Too many times we swear by folklore, not knowing that it has nothing to do with fact. Who exactly is a Jew? There was no word called Jew in the ancient world. The word Jew did not come out of Africa. It did not come out of Western Asia. It is a European word. There are people of the Hebrew faith all over the world. There are black Hebrews, there are brown Hebrews, there are yellow Hebrews. How is it that a bunch of Europeans called Jews dominate the word Jew to the extent of making you think that the very faith, Hebrew, is exclusive to them, leaving out all other people. All right. We become prisoners to circumstances in history, becoming prisoners to these circumstances in history, we still react to this conquest of the mind. In slavery, we wanted to associate ourselves with the people who had escaped from something. So we read a Jewish escape story called the Exodus. And we believed it. And we didn't examine the story. Because if you examine the story, you will find the story is told to instill faith in a people. And sometimes, if a story is told to instill faith and truth, the illustration used to get the point across need not be true. All right. All right. Tell me how can 600,000 people cross the Nile, cows, children, goats, sheep, and get on the other side. No laws. The now just dried up. It must have been muddy. And they didn't even get their feet muddy. Now you can do it with imagination, but in fact you can't do it. They copied these Western Asian people copied Nile Valley folk stories, personified themselves into the story, and sold you your own story, and you bought it. Now let's go back and deal with where they copied the story from. There's a three-volume work published by the University of Chicago on Egyptian literature. I would appreciate it if the people on my right would just let me be heard. Dealing with Egyptian literature. And there is a story in the three volumes dealing with a pharaoh 
who got somewhat despondent and his magician decided to take him rowing on the Nile and to make him more happy the boat was being roared by beautiful ladies. The lead lady stopped roaring and started crying and the Pharaoh was very much concerned with what had happened. And he asked the lead lady what had happened and said she had dropped her necklace in the Nile. And the Pharaoh told the magician to take care of it. At this period in history, all kings or Pharaohs travel with the magician. Instead of you and I having a fight, we have a contest between our respective magicians. We didn't take the nation to war. The two magicians settled the matter. So this magician parted the water, dried up the Nile, stepped out, picked up the lady's necklace, gave it back, the water came back, she smiled and it kept rowing the boat over. That's why the Jews copied the story about the part of the water. <laughs> What I am saying is that at this period in history, there was no such thing as a Jew. There were Western Asian people who later joined the Hebrew faith. There was an extensive series on the history of the Jews. They gave them an artificial history before Babylonia. But they had no clear history before their entry into Africa as visitors seeking food and shelter. There in Africa, they sought and found food and shelter They entered Africa with no clear language, no clear religion, and no clear culture. When they left, they came as 70 in number. They left 600,000 in number. They had a culture, a language, and a religion when they left. All taken from Africa. They were not Hebrews when they got there, but they were Hebrews when they left. Now you join the religion as though you got to do it with their permission because the European Jews of the faith gave you the illusion that everything must be dispensed to you because you invented nothing and you achieved nothing. And there in the Nile Valley, in the river valleys of Africa, you had set in motion the social thought that would be the foundation of what you know as Western civilization. yet you have forgotten how to claim it. Now, these visitors came into Africa in the 1700s B.C., led by a patron father, Abraham. 1675, Africa was invaded from Western Asia. Instead of taking the side of the Africans, they took the side of the invaders. But while under the invaders, where they served as collaborators and clerks and betrayers of their African friends, 
They produced the world's first wheeler dealer politician called Joseph the Provider. The Africans came back to power and said, those who wish to now obey African rule may stay, the rest will have to go. The African king came to power, and that is the king who knew not Joseph, the king who owed the Jews no favor. And the wheeler dealer politician Joseph did not have any power around the throne because the throne was now an African throne. And their early contact with us was as wheeler dealers. And they entered human history with their visit to Africa. They have never been our friends when we needed them. In the concept of a historical alliance between African people and people called Jews is a lie and a myth and a misconception. They have overplayed every event in history with us. Any time it was to their benefit, they have walked away from us. We are one of the most politically naive people in history. We have never made a good alliance with anybody. And everybody that has come among us have shown that they would betray us any time it was to their benefit. There is no exception, right or left. Right. That's true of every religion, it's true of every politics, and it's true of every single ethnic group. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now you wanna play a whole lot of ethnic partner games, I think you should make alliance with other ethnic groups, but watch the alliance. You should be partners, but when people break the alliance, you should be in a position to punish them. Right. And don't depend too much on the alliance. Right. Now after this period, we have to deal with it now because we are not dealing with Jews, because there are no Jews at, at this juncture in history. There is no Europe at this juncture in history. We're talking about Western Asian people. At this juncture, what you call the Middle East, that I call Western Asia, was West, was North West Africa. And this is documented in a book called When Egypt Ruled the East. All of those Mediterranean mulattoes and Indo-Europeans who would drift down to this area later wasn't there at this time in history. We are not arguing about the color of that vast number of people because the only semi-European people, and they were mixed, for the Romans and the Greeks. We are not arguing about the color of Christ. I don't argue his blackness. I argue his non-Europeanness. Right. His non-whiteness. Right. Ain't no possibility that he could have been white. Yeah. Right. Now, when we look at what we are talking about, in the change of the world. Let's look at this event in history and the reaction to it. 
Is it incidental that while carrying the cross up the hill, he's got 12 disciples? None of them stepped forward to help him with the cross. How about that? Who came forward? An Ethiopian, Simon of Serenia. Could this have been a brother helping a brother? Yeah. Otherwise, why nobody else helped him? Right. Took that cross up that hill. I'm trying to show you why we related to the humanity of all people, but all people have not related to our humanity. We have been the true believers. Now, after the Romans destroyed the last temple, of the people of the Hebrew faith, 70 A.D. Now you got to watch it. You've got to study the migration patterns of the world. Where did those Western Asian people go? I've seen no migration pattern that took them into Europe. I do see a migration pattern that took a large number of them into inner West Africa where a large number of people of the Hebrew faith lived in ancient Ghana, lived in peace up until 770 A.D. when they tried to collaborate with the Arabs to take over the country and the Africans expelled them from the country. We have illusions about people. Some time ago, someone was arguing about who's our friend, and I was at one of those very fancy parties, all tuxedoed down, <laughs> and I was talking to another great scholar, also all tuxedoed down, and I said that the, I would not be surprised if the day would come when I would see the Jews and the Arabs in the same political bed against the African people. The professor who was listening to me, who was well known and has a name similar to mine, was livid. And we could not misbehave among all those millionaires and well-dressed and well-perfumed ladies. And so all I said is that competent historians do the same thing to prove their cases as competent lawyers. They cite a precedent. All right. All right. They point what it has already happened. <laughs> There has already been a relationship between Africans and Jews and Arabs in Spain for 800 years when the African was the military arm that held Spain and the Mediterranean. And when they lost the power, the Arabs and the Jews came together, turned on the Africans and began to enslave them. The Jews went to Holland and found the Dutch East India and the Dutch West India Company and subsequently helped to find South Africa. That's my precedent. If you want another one, I'll give you another one. Now the same thing is happening in Detroit right now where well, there's a large Arab population and a Jewish population. Uh -oh. The same thing is happening around the Sea Island of Georgia, where they're pushing a lot of these blacks out of those islands in Georgia to build condos. Mm. Jews and Arabs money together against blacks. Mm. My point is that these two people 
allegedly Semitic, neither one happened to be our friend. I have not heard a Jewish professor or any other professor give me a clear definition of a Semitic. If you can't tell me what is a Semitic, you can't tell me what is an anti-Semitic. Now, as the population calling themselves Hebrews flourished in North Africa and in Western Asia, and this continued in the population in Africa, flourished until they were pushed back to North Africa until the 12th century in Europe, most of these Europeans were Christians and other European denominations. There was a fierce fight between the Arabs and the Christians. One group who did not want to belong to either one sought an option. And the option was the Hebrew faith. So what you are calling Jews are Europeans of the Hebrew faith. Many times they live in communities of their choice. They did certain kinds of work that other Europeans did not want to do and became so good at it, they dominated it. Portable wealth, gold, jewelry. And because they sold small things called jewelry, out of which came the word Jew. A European word it has nothing to do with their origin in Western Asia or Northern Africa when they were just Western Asian people of the Hebrew faith. You find large numbers of people of the Hebrew faith in India. You find some in China, some in the South Sea Islands. But the European tries to dominate everything he is a part of. And nothing came from the European mind that did not have as its intention the facilitation of the European domination of the world. It has. This is the essential mission of every European whether he is a capitalist, a communist, a Christian, a holy roller. This is the essential mission of Europeans, to dominate everything inside. And their crisis now is they are realizing that between the Africans and the Asians and the people of the South Sea Islands, they keep on having an increase in birth rate, and they keep on going to bed and not bringing it all. <laughs> Very soon, they're not only going to be a minority, but a tiny minority. All right. They cannot say that Africans or Asia have as their intention the conquest of Europe because neither one of them wants a thawed out icebox <laughs> that is agriculturally dying, that is politically dead. Right. So the greatest punishment 
we can inflict on them is to leave them in their misery. Why they are trying to hook into so many things that are ours is that is their lease on life. Now, because of difference of opinion on religion and finance, the people in Europe of the Hebrew faith in their various branches became good at certain bargaining things, money lending, fabric design and fabric manufacturers, theater management, department store management. And in Germany, where they had department stores, they had the fabrics, they had communication, then they were literally asked, yield something then when they did not yield, a madman said, I'll take everything. Yeah. Now, I have no problem condemning Adolf Hitler's murder. Whether it was six or six million, it was wrong. But this was a European problem started in Europe by Europeans. <laughs> I am sick of these Europeans washing everybody's face with this and not confronting this as a European problem. Go to Europe and get it settled. Those are the ones who, who, who started it. Now, in the 1880s, a lot of people of the Hebrew faith had the illusion that they were just like other Europeans, that they were integrated. And once they got their behinds kicked, and were excluded out of things, they began to have the idea that they needed a state of their own. They didn't exactly know where the state would be, but they drew the idea of a state from mythology because they never had a state that wasn't stolen property. <laughs> Their homeland of the European Jew is Europe. Now they can go back into folklore and mythology and tell you about a god named Yahweh who told them to get the to Palestine and be, get their homeland, but who told you that God was ever in the real estate business? <laughs> business? <laughs> All right. And who told the God that Palestine was unoccupied? <laughs> Always occupying something that's already occupied and throwing out somebody else. <coughs> now, <coughs> the Rothschilds controlled the purse of Napoleon. He offered them Palestine and they scoffed at it. So who want that sea of sand? They didn't want it then. They were doing all right in Europe, in the banking industry, in the theater industry. Well, when things began to pinch them, they began to reconsider. But they, they considered Brazil once. Any space big enough to be called a homeland. We should read Cam Weissman's 
autobiography, Trial and Error, and his approach to Chamberlain, and his approach to the British. When he said that we will not only be a baston to hold back the Asian hordes, we will preserve civilization and the communication system in Eastern Africa. Look at Palestine geographically. It's a door that swings three ways. It's at the back door of Europe, the side door of Western Asia, and the front door of Africa. Strategically, it is well located. It never, absolutely never, belonged to any European people. And this is another thing that my Shark Soon, our Muslim friend. In all honesty, in early history, it never it wasn't belonged to the Arabs either. Yeah, yeah. All right. It was an African country. The Arabs didn't get there in, in any appreciable number to about 1600 A.D. I'm not saying they shouldn't live there, but as a matter of historical fact, it's not the original home of the Arabs either. But people don't even ask questions about the Arabs. Now, at the time Zionism was born, Europe and its colonialism was cutting up Africa the British Empire was spread across the world and the sun wasn't setting on it. A corrupt Belgium king had houses of prostitution throughout Europe and was supporting all of them, although some of them he couldn't visit but once a year. And the prostitutes had full support all the year round. Leopold spending a lot of money, he needed to look around for some place to make some money. The Germans, who had been left out of the colonial scramble, wanted to get in on it somehow. So the conference was held in, in Berlin. The Germans hosted it. Out of the conference, the Belgians got the Congo, the French got large areas of equatorial Africa. Later, the Germans would get four good pieces in Africa, Tanzania, South, Nam Namibia, Southwest Africa, then called the Cameroons and Togo. Portuguese would get a little more. The largest piece really actually went to the French. They got all of equatorial Africa, equivalent of about 16 nations out of it. Not a single African was consulted. The main thing is that slavery was a business. Jews in countries where slavery was a business was just as much in the business as anyone else, mm -hmm. and no apologies. All right. In the colonial business, they were just as much in it as anyone else. In the domination of the West Indian trade, they were just as much in it as anyone else. That's a book called Barbados, the first Israel by Lionel Hutchison. When the Jews were driven out of England before Cromwell invited them back. 
Barbados was more of a Jewish, was the leading Jewish colony of the world. And when we look at Christopher Columbus and his exploration, why did some countries in South Africa, South America have 16 synagogues? If they didn't have no Jews, what would they do with so many synagogues? And who was Columbus in the first place? No one ever proved he was Spanish. No one ever proved he was Italian. There's seven different places where they say he was born. Baker, hustler, con man who discovered nothing. Some evidence proved he was Jews. Why did the Jews have to leave Spain? They were the money managers of Spain, the grandees. All this is so well documented. There's a book by a Jewish writer, I think, William Katz, and it's called Israel in Europe. Read the chapter called The Jews in Spain. The Africans and the Arabs installed them in Spain as the money managers. When the Africans and the Arabs lost in Spain, they had no mercy in turning on both of them. Thank you. Spain was widening up. If Spain was widening up and expelled the Africans and the Arabs and spell, expelled the Jews too, Spain didn't consider the Jews white, didn't consider the Arabs white, and didn't consider the Africans white, of course. The Dutch East India, the Dutch West India Company, and the chartered companies from England set colonialism in motion. My main point is that Zionism and the spread of colonialism walk side by side. In the mythological historical alliance people are speaking about never existed. And that the infiltration of Jews into our organizations, conspicuously giving a dollar and making sure their picture got taken while they're giving it, was an element of control. All right. All right. Their job was to control the mind. filtered into positions in education where they could control the curricula, yes, which is the control of the mind. This is the heart and soul of the viciousness of what Zionism has done. You've got Holocaust curriculas mandated. Our children now must write essays on the Holocaust and dare not study the history of slavery. And you've got teachers who will not teach African history and can get away with it because the union is not going to do anything about it. Someone took exception to me referring to a Jewish academic mafia. Mm -mm. There is a Jewish academic mafia. All right. All right. All right. And people are afraid of that academic mafia. All right. I encountered that just today. <laughs> we were supposed to go with our brothers and discuss Zionism, its history, its me mechanics. And some of our brothers decided that maybe the subject is a little too yeah, delicate. Yeah. So we had to come here in the slave theater and talk about it. <laughs> Thank you.
And yet we've always had a sympathetic attachment to the Jewish people because we think they are the people of the book. That's because we don't know the book. We're talking about Europeans, no different from any other European, right. as racist as any other right. Europeans, as ruthless as any other Europeans. All right. All you think you're talking about Moses' relatives. <laughs> Moses had nothing to do with the people we're talking about. All right. <laughs> What you need to learn from Zionism, because it is unique in its organization, is the fact that you need to organize Pan-Africanism across all ethnic lines, all religious lines, we need to stop talking about those specks of the dust called islands where slave ships put us down and concentrate on where the slave ship took us from, all came from Africa. <laughs> we need to create a world movement of African people, put our finances together. All right. All right. I just got a transcript of something today that I'm developing into a pan pamphlet, Pan-Africanism as a priesthood. I said we need to make a priesthood out of being free. We need to departmentalize our lives where so many of our young people who devote their entire life just to making sure that black people have fresh water. Right. So men, let's make sure that our people have good shoes. That's right. He's, he belonged to the, the shoe sainthood. That's right. Priesthood of the shoemakers. All right. And be honored. Come in, oh, this is, a, this is a nice shoemaker. Those are the people who keep us in shoes. All right. As the people who take care of the farm. All right. Those are the mechanic priesthood. Same as any other sainthood. All right, you under the Catholics got, got the saints for the sailors, saints for the widows, saints for the, uh, all these different people. Don't, put no, don't, don't make no problem for you. Why should it be a problem when we've got people to do something of everything that we need in order to survive, to stay on, on, on this earth? We came out of a society of our own creation where no one was ever alone and unattended to. All right. No teenage pregnancy. Mm -hmm. No girl of a certain age not married. All right. No mixed people and no mixed up people. All right. <laughs> All right. Nobody with a problem that nobody that they couldn't talk to. Yet no psychiatrist, no sociologists, none of these fineology people. And yet we were getting along. Our heads were straight, no heart attacks, no strokes, nobody shouted. No nervous breakdowns. We must have been doing something right. Amen. Now let's look at Zionism and, and let us close because Zionism is an extension of European mechanism of world dominance. You think it's something to deal with finding a homeland for a mistreated people. There's a lot of people involved in Zionism 
who could care less about whether Jews had a homeland or not. There's discrimination in Israel between the Sephardics and the Ashkenazis, <laughs> fighting for the upper hand in Israel. They don't want Arabs who are supposed to be Semitics. And they surely don't want blacks where they got their religion from in the first place. Israel is nothing but an outpost and a listening post for European world dominance. Here's a nation that can take 25 mile corridor inside of another nation's country and they're not even called imperialists. They need a safety zone. Now suppose America needed a safety zone between her and Canada, take 25 miles inside of Canada. That's my safety zone. Your own country. So let's stop romanticizing all of this. Suppose let's read some of the literature of the Bible. Read the Bible. Don't throw it away. It's a great piece of literature. But read your interpretation of it. They whiten it up, now you blacken it up. <laughs> Look at it from your point of view. Read some of John Jackson's work on it. Pagan origins of the Christ myth. Christianity before Christ. It was all old before they formulized and dogmatized it. Because the people called Jews are a small number of people, because they practice the essential selfishness of survival, in order to stay on this earth they had to be uh, thought they had to be manipulators and they're good at it. They never fight their real enemy. They must always create an enemy to fight, but they want an enemy that they can win. They make enemies out of us because we have such a sentimental attachment to them we don't fight back because we, if we fought back, we're fighting the people of, of the book. And then we look at that white Christ in our church, oh no, we're fighting his people. <laughs> then you hold back. And that's Michelangelo's picture he painted. He told you it was Christ. He never saw Christ. You know more, you're no, no more about it than I do. <laughs> Give them credit, they psyched the world. Right. <laughs> they ran the game. Three percent of the population, right. you 12 to 15 percent, they got 10 times more senators than you've got, more, more people in the House of Representatives you've got, more well-placed people, in every agency of government than you've got. They work at putting their people in strategic places to look after their interests. They work at putting their people in strategic places in our organization so they could watch us and control us. We are the only people who integrate on the executive level. That's right. That's right. They integrate on the lower level, but not on the watching level, not on the board, boardroom level. That's right. 
Let's make a reassessment of our role in Africa. That's right. And look at this generation that failed to deliver. Look at the Caribbean generation that failed to deliver because of their color fascination. Look at the Africans who created imitation European states and failed to deliver one single African state. And look at integration as a bag of worms because we were integrating into disaster. We have to stop letting people confuse us. That's right. That's right. Ain't no mystery about Zionism. It's just the people practicing the essential selfishness of survival, mm -hmm. looking after themselves. That's right. Well, no compunction mm -hmm. about looking after themselves at our expense That's or anybody right. else's expense if they could get away with it. That's right. You have to ask the question there, 350 white hate groups in this country. Jews are not fighting any of them. Yet they're fighting us. You would think with their memory of Nazism, they would burn down the headquarters of the American Nazi Party. Haven't touched it. You think they would kick the behind of every clean head or slick head, <laughs> hadn't touched the one of them. Right. That's right. It's an argument between white and white then. That's right. Right. They won't take on you because you've got confusion about the people of the book. That's right. Easy mm -hmm. Let's look inward at ourselves and some of the differences among ourselves. Mm -hmm. Peter Noel called me about that silly article he had in the <laughs> Village Voice and I was planning to write an article in rebuttal but I told him between Alton Maddox and Reverend Sharpton I thought your tail was spanked properly. <laughs> 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 <That's so laughs> He, he still think I should have written the letter. Let us realize that Zionism has had some great success among us and that some people have been bought and paid for and that there are a group of conservative blacks and I don't know what they're conserving except their miserable obscurity and their tragic cowardice. <laughs> there is no home but home. Yeah, yeah. And there's no home.